well, it's just going to be really informal because it's the, right now the three of us. Um, but this is this is what I had last week. I mean, last night too with people from 123. You know, it's we 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 have a lot going on right now, don't we all? And everybody's swamped, and everybody's um, it's difficult times. It is. Um, and remind me, Cynthia. You, your name is really familiar. You're on the DAC too, aren't you? Yeah. That's what yes. I thought. I need to um, bookmark this one for 114. So awesome. We have like a little, we'll just have a little DAC chat. <laughs> <laughs> um, Cynthia, were you also on the little subcommittee group? I should, I'm going to stop recording for a moment. <laughs> As far as the early literacy screener, there just wasn't a lot um, already in place. There wasn't a lot of knowledge or understanding or plans in place prior to me walking in. So there's just some catching up in those areas. You've uh, got a lot of work to do. I appreciate that. Well, let me share with you both what I had planned and um, and then we can also go with wherever you feel the need to mm -hmm. and we can just have this be an informal conversation. Um, you know, this was obviously the attribution of the, the Puget Sound started this work with these PLCs and we've taken it over. Um, I do also have some land attributions. Um, this is your region and, or is this, yep, this is your region. Um, and this is also recognizing the treaties that contributed to this. And this one is the, um, where people are currently. Pretty interesting seeing how that changes. And recognizing that acknowledgement is that but that first step it does not stand in for relation and action, but can begin to point toward a deeper possibilities for decolonizing relationships with people in place. Recognizing also the um, racial acknowledgement trauma. Um, and as we just add on that this is not to deny the racial trauma endured by other peoples of color, but we are calling out those who are just proportionally is affected by the violence. And a few norms, we've right, emphasizing grace. We've been, we've all been together before, so I can just go through all of this. We know how to engage. Um, so this is one of the things that when Patricia and I first made this plan, we thought to really focus on the RAN and fluency right now because of the RAN expectations being done in, in January. Um, but we have some review time, some um, team time, and some looking at the interventions piece as well. Um, so starting with just where we are, you two know me well. <laughs> so we'll start with the, um, the jam board I think you both put on, and I'll go to that jam board from last time. This is frame three. We do have, um, and I'll put this into the chat box for you so that you can add things or review and, and put thoughts or use it outside of these meetings too. Actually, I don't have to find it in here because it's in my notes. And you can see I have a, the first one. Oh, and also attendance link for clock hours. I'll put those both into the chat box. Okay. I know you, you're both disappearing from me. All right, that's okay. Hi, thanks. Welcome back, Krista. <laughs> All right, so I know we have you here from last time. And actually, it looks like, Cynthia, maybe you might not have been with us last time. So the question was, your name, position, elementary literacy specialist for Krista. You are a decision making. Um, Cynthia, I can add you on. Do you have a preference on color? or you can add on your own. Um, just a little bit of, of getting to know each other a little bit, although you two have, we've worked together before in the, the Dyslexia Advisory Council. Nonetheless, it's a great place to start with, just kind of who's been here. It's interesting to see who, who's not been with us, who's not here with us today, but who has been here. And there are people who will be on the email list when we send this out. What's your role, Cynthia? 
<laughs> yeah, I can add it if you'd like. So I know you're Bremerton. What's what's your role in Bremerton? Uh, assistant Director of Assessment and Data. I'm so used to my multiple screens at, at work that when I, I ran home to do this Zoom from home and I, it's just too many things. No problem, I can handle that. And Thank then the you. question is, I assume that you are a decision maker? Yes. Yay. So many of my PLCs are just teachers who get frustrated that they're like, we're not the ones who make these decisions. So it's easier that. Um, mm -hmm. I like how you say that you're a decision maker in some areas, Krista, <laughs> and then others working on that. Um, okay, so the idea then of these PLCs was just really to, to foster that regional collaboration so we all work together. Um, here are some agenda pieces. We're talking about you know, just that introductory pieces and we're going to look about the, the RAN. Um, and this is actually something I'm going to be doing next week with a district. I'm going to a district in my region and we're going to be doing some more intense reading on the RAN. I'm pulling out that 30 page document that we had uh, read for the council, looking at a couple of pages of that, as well as one from understood.org. We're really just trying to help our teachers understand why on earth are we doing this, particularly the specialists, and then how that connects into the, the fluency piece. And then looking at intervention practices, I think that's the next place that we're moving is, okay, we've done the screening, then now what, what do we do with that, that, that data that we're collecting? Um, so this is where we've, um, we only planned for three this year with this group. Um, we'll be meeting again in May 18th. And this was, when I say flexible roadmap, the idea is, if there's something that comes up between now and then, please let me know, and I'd be happy to make adjustments or, um, one, support you along the way, but if there's something that you'd like to bring up that you think would be a better choice for May, um, I mean, hopefully we've been doing progress monitoring all along and you're okay with that, but at the same time, what do we need to do to support as we wrap up this year and get ready for doing this again next year? <laughs> it's kind of work I'm thinking of for May. Um, so the piece that we did last time and I kept this time is because I think that one, we never know if they're going to be the same people, but, but you may have some different challenges this time. You may have some different um, you know, successes, some stories of, of challenges and hopes. So I do have two jam boards and um, if you'd like, we can give you individual time to kind of think about that and then talk about or if you want to just start talking and I'll kind of record, we can have a conversation with just three of us. Let me know if you need private think time first, or if you're ready to chat about the two prompts were a big challenge and what you hope to get again. Well, one of our challenges that I'm sure you're seeing it too, Krista, we just haven't been able to, um, just keeping our classrooms covered so that students are safe has taken a huge amount of our resources. So against best practice, I have been administering the RAND to most of our kindergarten and first grade students because our specialists are all covering classrooms. Mm -hmm. So it's being done very consistently and yet the students don't know me at the level that they would. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I'm keeping tabs, you know, the reason why I'm keeping notes on this too is that people who aren't here today, but I think could benefit from knowing that they're not alone in some of these mm -hmm. challenges. And I would say a big challenge um, is just the sheer number of students that have had, um, uh, um, you know, learning loss because of the COVID impacts. And so the amount of students that we need to support is at a record level. Um, so the challenge is just the sheer numbers of students that need help or tier two support. I would agree with that. This morning I had a, a meeting with the um, Washington Reading Corps and I don't know if either of you are you either of you familiar with that program? Yes. I mean, kind of ish. Um, they were asking me, I mean, when Cheryl and I 
were writing the K-1 program, that the, the tutoring guide, the whole intent was that this would be review. And this is mm -hmm. tier, the idea is for kids who were yellow and that, that the, these tutors would not be teaching, but they would be supporting and reviewing these things with kids. So in the phonological awareness and, and letter sound knowledge. And they're telling me that like half of the third graders are reading at a K-1 level. And they're saying to me, how do I teach them rhyming? How do I teach them sound symbol correspondence? And it's just like, okay, this is going to take a different shift because mm -hmm. this is not the intent of this program is for you to be a teacher. But if this is, if the teachers are saying, we need you to do this. Mm, that's scary. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it really is. I mean, so how, are, uh, Krista, what are you guys doing about these, how, how are we, especially with all of our teachers out, as you, Cynthia, you mentioned you're taking a lot of resources. One wonderful uh, innovative idea our principal had this year um, was to designate a tier time at each grade level in addition mm -hmm. to our program, um, traditional Wolf Den program. And so, um, we have, tr we have our traditional reading paras, I oversee the reading uh, support, that's happening. But there's an additional 30 minutes that the grade levels have carved out to have that conquer and divide support, not just in reading, but math. Um, so one 30 minutes, five days a week. And so that is another wonderful piece. And I was able to get some resources to get some materials in teachers' hands early in the year as the year launched as um, resources to teach for those kiddos that needed this extra help. Um, so that's, that's good. And I mean, I can say or with confidence that every student that does need support is getting support. So even though we have the big challenge with the sheer numbers, we're providing the support. Mm -hmm. It's just the uh, sheer number of students that are significantly below grade level uh, at a level that we've never had before. And I'm sure that's obviously very common with the um, school closures and the remote instruction that had happened. So I think we're, we're doing a really good job of addressing the challenges, but it, it's going to take several years to get where we need to be. And I would say one of the things that's been, you know, it's, when it's 80% of your students, it's not, it's not tiered intervention anymore. It's tier one. Yeah. Yeah. And so our, our teachers have spent a lot of time, you know, when we all went remote, they did a bunch of essential standard work mm -hmm. and then realizing, you know, what we were going to be facing this year with having kids back full time. They, they identified the essentials of the essential standards so that they can <laughs> really teach the essential learnings at all mm -hmm. levels. No, um, in their gen in their general classroom. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting hearing the two of you say that, and it sounds like you're you're not having any conflict between what you're doing and the gen ed, which is the case in some of the other ESGs where they're, the gen ed people are pushing back against the science of reading, and they're pushing back saying, "We're not doing this." And you it sounds like you're very lucky you don't have that. Problem. Well, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say it doesn't exist, <laughs> but we are, we are looking forward in our district and doing some things very explicitly with our K-1 teaching cadre um, and trying to protect that teaching cadre so that kindergarten teachers aren't moved to fifth grade. Our, our, our highly qualified kindergarten teachers aren't moved to fifth grade just because that's where the numbers are, that mm -hmm. we have this group of really um, effective teachers that have been really supported by the district to stay in those roles. That's great news. Glad to hear that. Yeah, we've been pretty fortunate because we've had, a, you know, a lot of work for KD at K2 literacy level. And so we definitely are on board and using and have a very highly effective core curriculum. And so I think, you know, despite all the challenges, we're in really good shape with an awesome core support program and have had some you know, really good success with the tier two supports. So 
we don't have like some of those other challenges, which is awesome. And so mm-hmm. I can say that, you know, it's been really heavy lifting gap filling of code work um, in a lot of ways more than ever because of the sheer number of gaps. But as far as training and that, um, our, 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 we've, it's been a, um, many years of work to get to this part uh, point. And so, um, for example, looking at our kinder, obviously they didn't have learning loss. They're our new cadre of kinders. And so something we might not have been, we weren't very good at, say five years ago, teaching phonemic awareness, mm-hmm. we can get those incredible scores by middle of the year. And so Absolutely. that is reassuring because we know those kinders going to first is just like, that will be like um, a regular first grade experience in terms of not having kids impacted by the COVID learning loss because they had their solid kindergarten instruction and move on to first. So um yeah, so really pleased with that. It's it's my biggest concern is the second graders. Our second grade students were kindergartners when school shut down in March of 2020. Yeah. And then first grade, sheer amounts of students that were homeschooled versus remote learning. And so those second graders are the cadre. And I think that probably is pretty common throughout our our country even not just Washington state because that's the early learning of literacy those are the kiddos that Mm -hmm. my concern is our intermediate teachers will need extensive support on the reading foundational skills more than ever they always did need that but the sheer the numbers of students would be significantly less that they would have to be the heavy lifter of the reading foundational work they would have gotten that Mm -hmm. more Mm -hmm. in a tier two setting out of the classroom but i'm thinking that gosh we really need to do some intermediate Mm -hmm. teaching of the reading foundational skills um, components i mean they've received some but the nitty-gritty you know Mm -hmm. phonemic awareness and the code work and the phonics and alphabetic principle all those things uh, to understand, we have a great scope and sequence of codes layout in our program. Um, and the intermediate teachers have been introduced to that over the past, but I don't think it has been a go-to thing that they have utilized deeply because they haven't had to. But mm-hmm, anyway. Mm-hmm. No, that's a really good point. And I think that that speaks to what I heard this morning of you know, 50% of their third graders reading at K-1 level. I don't remember which district that was. <laughs> and I would agree the second graders are of concern, but our first graders and our kindergarten, I mean, I look at the students that I'm seeing in buildings and they weren't in preschool. They haven't been socialized outside their family home. We're seeing not necessarily early literacy gaps as if they had missed two years of in-person learning, but they are not kindergarten students like we've had in the past. And so though our teachers will, um, I'm sure, do a great job with early literacy skills, it's there are other things that are getting in the way of kiddos learning what's being taught. And so I think we have several years of um, kids coming into us that have had different experiences prior to entering school than the students that we're used to. So you're saying lack of pre-K experience has been really. In, in. Yeah. And it's just, and it's, it's even, I mean, they've just been home with their families. Mm-hmm. So not only is it not preschool, but it's not going and spending yeah. time with the extended cousins. It's not, yeah. even, we're just seeing a lot of kids are emotionally and socially so immature, undeveloped because they haven't been in the, haven't had those experiences. And I, that's not going to end with, the kiddos that are going to be kindergarten next year. No, that's a really, really good point. And I think about, I mean, even no longer attending children's museums and play dates and, and, and like all those social things. Mm -hmm. This is a hard time for us all right now. We're becoming so much more isolated that, Mm -hmm. that you're right, that we, 
And, and if we don't, I mean, I walked into the, um, the mall the other day to go to the library because we have a library in our mall. <laughs> and I was astonished and just shocked to see there at the entrance area indoors, a mother and her small children, both of all three of them unmasked. And so it's like it, our, our culture and our thoughts of this have been really changed and fearful of how do we protect everyone because that's the first priority. But then this is going to be an interesting, definitely barrier I hear as well. Thank you both tremendously. I, I, one of the things that I, I, you possibly saw me go into when you said you have a strength in, in your um, core, do you mind me asking what you are using for core? Yeah, sure. We have core knowledge, language arts, uh, so CKLA. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's never a perfect curriculum, uh, highly rated ed reports, but it, in my what, 20, over 25 years K2 teaching, it, it is the best reading foundational core program I've worked with. So I feel anyone can become a strong reading teacher with how it's laid out. So, I'm really glad to hear that. You know, it's yeah. funny you mentioned that because just on Friday, I was attending um, a summit with Sally Shaywitz and Ann Cunningham and... Um, who was the other one? Tim Rosinski. It was very good. But Ann Cunningham was talking about how the importance of, of good core, because she's saying in teacher prep programs that she teaches at Berkeley, that we don't have the time or they don't have the time, my former, um, to really do justice. And you don't become a good reading teacher until you've been in the field for a few years. And that mm -hmm. core can really help you with that. Cynthia, what about you? Do you also use CKLA or something else? We use Wonders, and in our primary grades, we've added Hegarty because there's a bit of a gap. Well, it just, there isn't enough. There isn't enough phonological awareness. I always forget, is Hegarty with a T or a D? I'm looking for my book over there. Two E's, one and a T. Two E's? Yeah, it's Hegarty, not Haggerty. Most people spell it Haggerty. Oh, Sorry, yes. Sorry, my screen's so -G -G -G. small, I can't see it. H-E-G-G-E-R-T-Y. -G -G -E okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought. I have, I have a book over there. I'm not sure if I can reach it. But <laughs> um, thank you. I appreciate that. And I also sure. had mentioned that that K, you know, the phonemic awareness strength that I heard in, in you both as well. Um, and then there was the other question of um, what do you hope to get from and get in, in with this group? Well, when I signed up, I just wanted to make sure that um, I was, well, obviously being up to date on the K2 uh, screening um, pieces, but most uh, for me was thinking about um, how to organize the data, the communication part were kind of the key things that I was interested in hearing how other districts um, have, are going to do it, have done it. I mean, we're a little tiny district. We don't have, you know, a whole 15 people in a large curriculum and assessment department. And so I'm curious to see like Seattle Public Schools or Spokane to see how are they organizing this? I, I feel now I have a better grip on it before when I signed up uh, today because I've mm -hmm. seen through our data person, how they got some direction from their ESD for Skyward setup on how it could look possibly. I don't know if it was, they are told to do it this way or here's an option for your district, but our data person has already set something up in Skyward. So now I can see, I guess this is the way we're doing it. And, and it, it seems feasible. And, and, yeah, I haven't used it yet. I mean, I've looked at it. I've looked at the, the notes. I haven't had time to go in there and start clicking the yes, the no, et cetera. We're using the data, but I haven't entered it into Skyward yet, if that makes sense. It does. Um, I would be careful because I had heard feedback of that. Um, filter it carefully because I someone had mentioned an ESD training through about Skyward that wasn't by somebody who... There was, a, there was something that it was incorrect. I can't remember what it was in one of these trainings. So it's just like, use the knowledge you have of the, the expectations of the law to make sure that we're doing what should be done. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and I actually, in my my district, we had some of that because I I had to say, hey, we're not entering Maybe RAN that you. here. <laughs> Maybe that was you then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we're not entering RAN. We are looking at the four areas and then yeah. checking as if, it, do we see that they might have possible indications of not we're yes, no, we're, it was, yeah. So I think now how it's set up, um, okay with clarity, it will be fine. Um, I did have, you're, you're not the only ones dealing with this and I just actually put it into, um, I think I put it here under Washington RLCs. Yes, this question has been going around the state actually with the question of, um, so someone had talked about um, what to do with this data. Could we, you know, for, some, for example, someone was talking about creating a, a Google form where people could put in the information and then the student information systems person could upload it directly to CEDARS. Um, Cause this is just a question of, we've been asking, um, this said the, their current plan was to have the principal enter all the student data after the teacher's student in. My understanding was if you put it into Skyward, it just communicates up to CEDARS. You don't have to do any extra pieces, right, Costa? Yes, and, but there's, you're reporting to the state more than, yes, they're at risk for word level reading difficulty like dyslexia. No, you have to, up the, our student um, SIS person, she has to, up the, the, the data that she sends has to include the screener tool that we used, the date that the screening mm -hmm. happened, yeah. are they at risk, yes or no, as well yeah. as all the interventions that are in place for that student. Uh, I everything you said up to all the interventions are in place, I think is included in ours. Uh, I don't have that. I left my folder at work, but yeah, all those other pieces are there. Um, and I'm trying to think what else there was a piece with. Um, I, obviously, we're using two assessments, one that does the first three, the, the extra new assessment, the RAN is something different. Um, my understanding is we're not selecting RAN in our situation. We check Acadians. RAN mm -hmm. is just one additional piece. Um, so I think we're in good shape with that. Um, as far yeah, the as guidance is to follow the instructions on the published tool that you're using that was an approved tool. Right, right. So we're using iReady and they mm -hmm. iReady has published their own RAN and a flowchart on how you identify risk. Mm -hmm. And so there is a whole dyslexia export that will come out of iReady that will indicate if this student, this was one of my things that made me very happy. I wasn't sure how this was all going to work. And I was mm -hmm. very worried that I was going to end up looking like the 60% of students that aren't at standard at reading all have dyslexia. And the good news is it's not telling me that. Good. Their export is identifying a handful of students. And of that handful there was one that had no problems with the RAN and four that did. So those four, I felt very confident and comfortable saying, yes, these are students that are at risk for a reading difficulty like dyslexia. We were looking at maybe looking at iReady at some point, but I know when, and I know it just changed in the November meeting that it has to have the four areas where iReady didn't have all four. Actually, this was last year. This was last spring that we made that decision. Okay. And so I'm sure iReady will change it. And I sounds like- They this, have four. Mm -hmm. uh, it did, when I looked at it, they must've changed it. Because when I looked at it, it did not have all four. No, they, they've four. added. That, that's they've new not, that they have all four. Okay. Well, we had then, all four, but they weren't expecting that you would to administer all four. They well, had a price. Those, so this is one thing that I want to help with have the, 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 the council clarify, uh -huh. because even with the RAN RAS, there is not uh -huh. the expectation that you do all no. four. There is the expectation that you use a screener that has all four. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where we need to clarify that your screener needs to have all four in case your kids don't know the alpha, the letters and numbers, you have the options of the, the, the you know what I'm talking about. Objects That's been very confusing, Alicia. So when I'm in my assessment, my district, what's confusing for me is district assessment coordinators are DACs, but I'm also on the member of the dyslexia yes, DAC group. I know. So it's like, which DAC am I today? 
<laughs> trying to help my peers understand that they have to provide for for you so that you can find one. A child has the vocabulary yes. to demonstrate the processing Yes, has been really challenging. Most districts are giving for because they're not sure what to do. Well, and I think, but you know what, that's a really good input for me to make sure that we clarify mm -hmm. at the next webinar. And while we're still on that, I would love for, for us, when we report to the state, we're reporting a student is a one, two, or three, a one, they were screened and they're not at risk, right. a two, they were screened and they are at risk. Hold on a second. A three, I want to focus on hearing yeah. you, but I, yes. I, I want to write this down too. Um, oh, I'll be able to remember that part. You go ahead. That's okay. <laughs> a three, a three, they were not screened and they are right. at risk, but I need a four that says not screened because I'm an emerging multilingual and I don't have a published RAN in your native language, but I'm not going to assume you're at risk. Right now, my EL students that I'm not scan that I'm not screening, my only choice is to label them a three, not screened, but at risk. I thought we had a mul emerging multilingual in there. So tell me again what well, number one. I heard it was coming and I asked my student, my okay. Skyward person and she contacted OSPI Skyward person and she was told, no, we're only entering a one, two or three. So one is screened at risk, right? One not is screened, screened, not at risk. Not at risk, okay. And two, two is screened, is screened at, at risk. At and risk. three is like my self-contained special education students. They've already had a battery of tests. We already know that they're at risk for a variety of learning difficulties. They don't have the vocabulary to to give to do a RAN with me, so I'm going to give them a three, right? So, so that's, that's, not what our, that's not what our three is. Our three is the multilingual piece that I don't have the verbiage in front of me how to say it correctly, but the first two are the same, and our mm -hmm. third is that ELL component one. And that might be what you're saying, but what the state's going to hear when they see that three is not screened at risk. That's what it means. I wish Which I had a different to me. with me because um, yeah, that's not, anyway, our data person went to the ESD whatever training and she mm -hmm. gave screenshots of all this. And mm -hmm. so I so don't know. So it sounds like we need some clarification yeah, on that maybe there's an issue And maybe it's, part. yeah. Cause that's not what I've seen in our screenshots from her training and what it looks like here, okay. but maybe she doesn't have it right, so. Or maybe my person didn't go to the ESD training, she just went to OSPI. Okay, interesting. Well, and we've had some different that... things come through where the OSPI gave us yeah. one piece of information about assessments and she received different information. Yeah. And I think like... that's part of the challenge of all this. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. because I had, you know, an issue where early on where someone was saying you have to give the RAN to K-1-2. No, we don't. We have that as an option. And mm -hmm. so I, I feel like I've spent a lot of energy mm -hmm. um, trying to share information and educate, which is fine. Mm -hmm. I have that opportunity and that privilege. But um, with folks that were not believing what I was saying. <laughs> uh, and even though I'm on the Dyslexia Advisory Council. So that was <laughs> frustrating. <laughs> well, and that's where, when you're saying the K-1-2, I'm just so confused where they would get that because even if you look at our, our matrix, it feel, I feel like it says pretty clearly K and one. Yeah, the matrix mm -hmm. is beautiful. And I think it's because the person wasn't understanding, they were looking at the law, it's the K-2 mm -hmm. okay. law, and their focus yep. was it's on the law. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So no, they were I totally speaking get a different that. language than I was speaking. <laughs> I appreciate that. So um, before we move on, Cynthia, what, is there anything you'd like to add about something you hope to give or get? Um, part of the reason I joined was just because I'm new to the region. And so I just want to calibrate with my regional peers and get out and, and just make those connections and make sure that we're, you know, that we're representing our communities and, and doing things as to cause as least conflict between districts as possible, districts and parents. <laughs> That's a fantastic idea. I love it. <laughs> so let's just get into the, the RAN a little bit then. Oops, I'm going to go to, here we go, this one. Um, the RAN and fluency, I know we've talked a lot about this because you both are our um, council members, um, but the question that I have for both of you is, have you seen the administration, oh wait, you're not using the RAN RAS, are you? You're using the uh, ready one. I and am, but to get ready and to make sure that I wasn't misunderstanding, I did do a bunch of research into the RAN RAS and watch a bunch mm -hmm. of the videos to see you know, knowing that um, 
that's really what we're trying to all replicate mm -hmm, mm -hmm. with these other tools. I appreciate that. Um, and Krista, you're not using the RANRAS either, are you? Yes, we are using the RANRAS. Oh. And I love that handout with the administration directions. That has saved me so much time because once I get that standard score and the percentile, I'm not doing the other couple pieces. So it saved hours. And I love the link to the age calculator and the tips that if they can't, you know, try to get at least a couple of those um, cards done in the sense that if they don't know their letter names, you're not going to force the letter name one and do mm -hmm. the other two and three. Right. Um, yeah. I, I, I think that there are some pieces in this that aren't that clear. And I'm hoping that having this, trying to disseminate this administration tips that I made will be helpful with that. You know, now that I think about this, this is, a, this is another piece that would be useful just to throw out to the public via the, um, I see you both nodding through the mm. webinar, mm. or or let them know that they should contact their EL, their RLCs for this because this is you know, at these these kind of PLCs we have this opportunity to connect and share and, and and this is again why I want people to come to these is we do offer some helpful things. I'm glad to hear you say that, Krista. Yeah. So I couldn't remember if I had shared this with you before or not. Yeah, and the PowerPoint <laughs> reference there was excellent and the video was great. And so I used the video to share that with my reading parents who do the, did the administration and shared the PowerPoint with them too for some background knowledge. But even that first part about skipping the age and grade equivalents saves so much time. So that was awesome. Thanks. And we do, we do have a, um, it's not stated here, but there is a district that's working on a digital calculator where you could, all you have to do is put in the raw scores, the, the time, and it will tell you the um, standard scores. So that would be nice, but working on that, so. I'm glad to hear that that was a useful piece. Um, and then there's also, I mean, I think we've already talked about that, that additional information and why we've, we've talked about using some of those. So I'll go ahead and just kind of um, add on this piece of the why on that and where the RAND falls into this. And this is a slide that I made kind of wanting to help connect that ran to this to people who are not as familiar because it, I feel like it really stresses or, or it, it helps us in the automaticity piece that you may, where's my, I'm looking for my spotlight thing here. You may be accurate, but the question is, are you automatic? And that's the place where the ran is really coming into is that automaticity of being able to respond to something you already know. And so it's what we're not, we're not even talking about their, their word knowledge here when we're tapping into the, the RAN, we're just talking about their ability to automatically respond to a prompt and to, to draw on that phonological awareness piece. And so I thought that this was a useful, just kind of, Framing, I, I got a lot of this from, um, what was his name, Tim Rosinski, and I added a bit of my own, just looking at the fact that you, you need this base, that accuracy first, to develop then your automaticity, you get that, get it right first, this is something I say often in my trainings, slow down to get it right, and then you speed up and practice a lot to get it automatic. I, mean, I, do, I think about and use an example of my kids when they play cello. And like, they want to go really fast. I'm like, no, no, slow down and get it right first. <laughs> and then you can practice its automaticity. So it's in the back burner, whether it be reading, writing, any of those skills. Um, and then of course, as you are more automatic, then you can start adding in that, that prosody and the expression, and which of course leads to reading comprehension. Thoughts on this and whether or not it's something that your teachers I mean, like the next prompt I had was simply, you know, what's new, what's reaffirmed, um, what do you need? So let's just talk about, you know, when it comes to RAN RAS, reading fluency, these pieces, um, do you feel like your teachers get this, need this? I'm saying, Cynthia, you're saying, 
<laughs> they, they don't get it, they do need it. <laughs> Tell me more. Um, I feel like we still have this, we teach phonological awareness and phonics and K and one without any comprehension or, and then in second grade, we just suddenly teach only comprehension and we don't address any of the rest of it. And we end up in this spot where we never get to automaticity with those skills that we're learning. Do you know what I mean? I do, I do. And so instead of looking at, okay, where K1 is really focusing on this building my decoding skills and accuracy, it sounds like you then you move to here without recognizing the fact that we need to get automatic with these skills so that, I mean, that, that takes practice, that takes time, that takes a lot of work for some of our kids to develop that automaticity. And it is one of the weaknesses in the Wonders curriculum is in those foundational skills, there aren't enough, if you just you followed the teacher's guide, there aren't enough practice opportunities for any of the skills, right? So it'll be, we're doing, on set and rhyme today, and there will be three words to practice as a class. And then, and then we move it. on the next day. <laughs> right. And so teachers are having to know, because it's not explicitly in the curriculum, they need to know which pieces do they need to add in more and which pieces right. do they need to do less of. Because as right. any, with any of those published curriculum, there's more than you could teach in a, two years. Well, and that completely explains why you're adding in the Hagerty is because of some of those gaps that you're hearing. What about the decoding? Are there decodables? Um, actually, I think my kids use wonders and I remember very mm -hmm. authentic texts. And um, I don't remember, now granted my kids start using wonders. I wasn't really paying attention to the K1 as much as two and beyond, but are there decodable texts that support and align with the phonics that they're learning? Yes, and they are not the stories of the week that you do all your comprehension work in. They're add on reproducible pieces. There are some decodable leveled readers, but you have to purchase those separate. Well, they're not really leveled. They're decodable and then they're matched with the units. So um, those are an add on. Those aren't part of the core purchase. And do you guys have those? And when I was in like Washington, we bought them for all K-3 classes. Bramerton does not have those. Because I think that would be my concern is how do you, how do you build this automaticity without lots of decoding practice? And there's a lot of, I'm going to go to teacher pay teachers and I'm going to buy the wonders unit to day three extra passages that I can run off which are very similar to what Wonders is providing, but they're actually easier to find than the ones in Wonders. I don't, I mean, don't know if you've ever spent any time in there. <laughs> it's just, no, there's, a, there's a ton of material in it and the searching is hard. Um, so it just, it, it requires a lot of knowledge on the teacher side about both where to find things and when to use them. Sounds like that would take some support on your part mm -hmm. to help them with that. Or, or as I'm not sure if that's your role as the district, um, since you said DIC, the, the assessment, assessment coordinator, mm -hmm. versus is there somebody who's a letter, literacy specialist like Krista who can help mm -hmm. your teachers in that way? We're working on it. You both mentioned you're small. I, I mean, when I think small, I think 150K 12. Are we, I assume you're bigger than that. I'm about 46 to 4,800 K-12. So we're so technically than, probably medium, yeah. So more than one high school, more than one middle elementary then. Yes, five elementaries, one K-8, one middle school, one traditional high school, one alternative high school. So a bit on the bigger side for us. And Krista, are you bigger or smaller than? Yeah, we're small. We're two elementary schools, a middle school, a high school. Mm -hmm. Still, you've got two elementary schools <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> for a lot of the districts I, I work with around here. That's not the case. Um, I, so think, I was just going to add with, with our CKLA curriculum, it really does a beautiful job of just the emphasis on that code practice. So we have more than enough. You have um, 
remediation, you have pausing points, you have the assessment remediation guide, we have a decodable text, you know, working from the, you know, right from the beginning on. So we have more than enough for to build that automaticity. But it seems that that prior to COVID, that was an area where we're really moving towards and focusing on because there seems to be out there in, in the gurus of, of the world, using that as a primary focus with the brain imaging and understanding how we have to build the bridge and, and so on, because we tend to struggle um, getting to that automaticity piece. When you look at say second grade data and we have say 25% of our students are not meeting that oral reading fluency norm. It, what is that, you know, to really dig deep? It, is, is it just the, the dimensions of fluency? Most likely for many kids, no. Is it decoding? Is it, you know, and so mm -hmm. on. So that second grade challenge of getting those kids automatic. We've, all, we've been working on it, of course, K-1, but um, really have to become expert at understanding what part of automaticity do we need? Is it is it at the word level, the code word you know level? Is it the dimensions, et cetera? So, and I, I mm -hmm. sounds like the experts out there because I've been reading a lot about it, you know, before COVID hit, and, and actually a lot of webinars through COVID are really focusing on that area now to better understand how do we build that automaticity piece. Mm -hmm. And that's where we could we talk about orthographic mapping mm -hmm. and really making sure that that. I mean, not only are we accurately decoding to read, but then we're going backwards and we're noticing that sound symbol correspondence. And so we're doing the, the spelling and that work to really create an orthographic map of that sound symbol connection and really to solidify and to build that automaticity mm -hmm. with you. Keep looking to see when somebody wants to add in. <laughs> That's what I love about that. I can see your faces. I hate when people don't have their videos on. So thank you. Appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go back to our, I think at this point, we, I just had, a, like I said, this reflection time uh, and which was leading to this whole group conversation, which goes a little more, more quickly with just two of you know, what was new, what was reaffirmed. And I guess we, what we haven't really talked about, I mean, we, we touched on it a little bit with Cynthia with when you said that, that your teachers don't have this as much as they need um it, it, that kind of became a, a what do we need but I think the you know, last time people brought it into much bar bigger of what do they they need versus just uh, talking about ran ras mm -hmm. and fluency and, and professional development mm -hmm. so I mean we can open this up to um just a, a little bit more conversation if we want to or we can move then into our our bio break, and then to the next topic. I'll add on your screeners. I know that you said you're using iReady. And so Krista, did you say you're using? The RAN uh, RAS. Mm -hmm. The RAN RAS? Mm -hmm. Yes. And, and, and for the other skills at Acadians. Yes. Oh, you, so you're here already then. So other thoughts on anything new or any needs that you see from what we've been talking about so far? I need time to work with the teachers and there's just because of mm -hmm. the COVID challenges, you know, it's been more about collaboration versus professional development per se. Our model has switched um, and I feel like there's a lot of misunderstanding out there because they've heard about this RAN RAS. And even though I've had, you know, an opportunity last spring to talk about it, I've had a few uh, things come at me from intermediate teachers, even though my focus is K through two, to say, can you, this parent wants their child tested for dyslexia. And I, and I have to say to them, well, our school psychologist will be the person to do that. This assessment that we are giving measures the RAN. <laughs> and this is one piece of pertinent foundational things to be screened, but it's only one part of, you know, so we have a lot of people focused on dyslexia. They're, they're going to diagnose dyslexia, even though I've said, no, it doesn't. <laughs> and this is the process. And so um, I guess... I, I need to communicate more so there is less um, 
misunderstandings because the, even having me on the council and, but I, I have mostly the opportunity to just chat with the K2 teachers, but it's getting out to the upper end that they're diagnosing dyslexia down there. And I got those struggling fifth grader. Can you give them that RAN test? I'm like, no. <laughs> so. And I think along with that, Krista, a little bit of, we already know what to do with students that are struggling with word level reading. Just because we can, I, we can give a screener and say they have some indicators that make them at risk mm -hmm. for a, a reading disability like dyslexia. It's not, that's not going to change what we do. We already know what those students need. We already have the tools. And a, a little bit of that I think is, so it's that, like you said, communication. How do we help our staff and our families know that this is just because we're now layering in the screener mm. does not mean that we're changing our whole intervent MTSS intervention structure. This is going to help us be smarter about it. Mm -hmm. And hopefully over time, the interventions that we are using are more effective, that we are fine tuning our craft, that we are developing deeper skill sets within our staff that are delivering those interventions, right? But it's, this, this screener is not going to suddenly mean that every student that might have dyslexia is fixed. And it doesn't mean that we're suddenly going to provide four hours a day of Orton-Gillingham, you know, it's just, I think there's some confusion out there and it's how do we address that in a unified way that doesn't take away from how the work that went into getting us to this place where dyslexia is now a top of conversation, right? It's like, how do we not undo that and yet kind of get everybody to take a breath and relax about now that we have a screener? Doesn't mean that are the whole apple cart's upside down. No, that's a great point because I feel like we have a really highly effective system. And I was sharing with Alicia before the meeting started, we're not seeing surprises. Like now that we've added the RAN, our other assessments were awesome and still are. So there isn't like, oh, look at this. We're catching kids that we wouldn't have caught. No. In fact, the surprises have been more like this student has some challenges with RAN, but look, they are at benchmark despite this working against them or they're just below. We have very few students that um, are very poor in RAN and well below in Acadians. And the well below an Acadian scoring at the first, second, third percentile, we would have already been red alert on them. I think the challenge has been though, um, because of COVID impacts, we, we didn't, and we wouldn't have moved faster anyway, because we need to give students opportunity to respond to the intervention. And mm -hmm. it's, the it's the thinking, okay, were they in school? Were they remote last year? How much time? Right. I, right now we're confidently moving on those kids that are appearing to be red flags at this point in the year. Probably wouldn't have done it any sooner because of most of those kids were not even in school or they were remote or homeschool. So we need to see how they respond to our, our gold standards of interventions. No, I appreciate that. And um, as I hear you, I'm, I'm thinking both of you are very lucky that you're in systems that have that because um, while this is moving into the next topic and I, I do hope we can take a very small little bio break very soon. If I can put this up, we could chat about it and, and after we come back from our bio break. But I think that there are a lot of districts who don't have this kind of structure, who, do, who don't aren't as well established as I'm hearing the two of you talk about with being able to support the students. I mean, Krista, you're saying we recognize that these kids, this is only affirming what we know. And Cynthia, I loved what I heard you say too, when you said that um, this is not doing, this is, this is not changing what we're doing, it's informing what we're doing. I think you two are in a place where you can make those statements. I think that statewide, we're not, a lot of districts aren't there and a lot of districts are still at the MTS what? I mean, I, I had this conversation and, and showed this slide to a district in another region and was told, well, we do this. We have tier one is gen ed, tier two is a title app and three, tier three is sped. And I take a deep breath. <laughs> I just took one for you. <laughs> 
Right. So on that note, let's take a little bio break, maybe um, Perfect. two to three minutes, uh, come back at five after. How does that sound? Sounds good. I will stop the recording. Uh, whoops, I have to stop sharing in order to do that because I have to find my recording thing. Well, that's something that I will bring up to um, Shelly and talk about for some clarification on the webinar um, and look at those categories and make sure that we are all statewide clear on what a one, two, and three are. So we're planning another um, webinar. We have the, the dates listed on the website. Um, and we, we just canceled the one because of the shifts that were going on. But I think if you go to the About Dyslexia page, you'll still see, um, it still says January 19th. Well, that's unfortunate, but if you click that, you will see the list of all the dates. So there you can see the next one we're going to have will be February 15th and then March. I mean, I, I mean, we are having, we've had conversations about whether or not we want to continue having this monthly because uh, last year, I think we only did about four, three or four per year. Uh, we did them kind of when there was sometimes something new or when no one had heard from us for a while, for a while that just to say, hey, we're still here, a reminder, you should be getting ready to do us. Um, and especially with the capacity shifts that we're doing right now, Sandra hasn't been replaced. Um, right now, it's, the work is shifting to Shelly and Heidi and Annie Pinnell more. So um, right now, this is what we have published. So I'd like us to stick with that, even if we don't have a lot new, it's just to kind of say, hey, reminders. And maybe we're going to shift them to more um, office hours type. To say here we're here here to have a chat about how things are going what, what we're doing so if you haven't signed up feel free to connect in that way so structured literacy but one of the things that you know just to back up a little bit um this came out of a, of a conversation about high quality interventions and i think that there might be pieces of this that we addressed last time i'd have to go back and look but i think it's it's good just to have a conversation this is where I think a lot of districts are asking us to go next, as far as the council, is to really clarify what we mean by, I'm going to use my drawing that will stay, what do we mean by evidence-based multi-sensory structured literacy interventions? And I mean, as you, we talked about the next last one is that multi-tiered systems of supports. So this is this is a piece that, um, actually, do I have anything in the notes thing? Nope, but um, one of the things that we, we talk about here a lot is, particularly on this one, is that saying of, you can't intervene your way out of a bad tier one. And really is that, is your, your general tier one universal support reaching 80% of your kids. If it's not, then that's what we need to be looking at. Now I hear Krista, I mean, you're raving about yours. Cynthia, it sounds like yours needs a little bit of support, but it's, you're getting there. Um, but that, that you two have come from places where this is pretty well, pretty working, it sounds like. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, absolutely. I think, um before we got our CKLA, we did a lot of work on understanding reading foundational skills and we're pulling in best practices and so on, but this has made it so much better to have that core to refer to so everyone can be an expert reading teacher and in reality of under, like even if you don't understand this, the curriculum is so supportive that this is giving all children access to that great foundation. Just giving you an opportunity if there was anything you wanted to add, Cynthia. Um, I do have a resource in here if you need or would like um, from the National Center for Improving Literacy that I'll stick in the chat box for you. That I find a useful piece on where, I mean, it's great that you, you mentioned that. I love how you said that even if you don't understand it, you're still able to do it. <laughs> um, and I will click this for us just to, for you to see what, what this link is. It's um, an improving literacy brief um, that I think there, there's so many great things on NCIL. If you, if, 
But in your spare time, right? That's actually what I'm here for is to help fill you read through some of those pieces. Um, but I think that this is a useful one when it says, what are we looking at at the district level? What are we looking at the school level? Have we, and I love this, have we clearly and publicly articulated that family engagement? Um, do, our, do we bring in the game family engagement and literacy? Are these aimed to support our literacy goals and targets? Um, and then in the school level, how are we doing then with our MTSS? And they have added the R for reading on that. How are we providing families with information and resource, resources to support their literacy development at home? And are we aligning our literacy goals, are we aligning all this work with our literacy goals and targets? So I thought this was a, just one of a useful infographic to support us as we talk about that multi-tiered system of so support. Like I said, they have so many good resources in here. This is one of my favorite sites to look for. So toward that end, I also have, um, was so this is a new doc that did I show this last time Krista I, think so. I, I believe so if not it was from a different meeting but I have seen this okay um Cynthia have you seen this new version of Nancy Young's ladder reading did you share this in one of your school classes that you're doing? Yeah. So our elementary, <laughs> I talked to our elementary director, our director of elementary ed into taking those courses with you this year to help get us tooled up to do things differently in elementary next year. And she shared all the folders that you'd shared with her. And I think that's where I saw this. That's awesome. Well, I like, I mean, one of the things that I've been starting to draw attention to more is the, the circular nature that these are not static and really helping draw attention to particularly those who are more stuck in that structure of these you're helping that, that one thing i like about this one is it shows that these are added on that somebody who is in who is receiving i'm trying to also help us get out of the language of i mean mm. even yesterday there was somebody who's saying well you know right now we've got kids who who are tier five because they would normally be tier three but because of covid and, and their needs are so strong and he's talking about kids being tier one or tier two or tier three. And this is, <sighs> thank you, Cynthia. I just took a deep breath and it's like, how do I, how do I push back on that and say, these are actually, you know, the kids are kids that so everyone is a tier one kid and that they receive these other additional supports as they need. And so that was, that was a challenge for me in that moment to push back in a way that I'll be listened to. But I think that that's, that's one of the challenges what I like about this with those arrows is that you have that understanding that you're not stuck in any one. And we all have that jagged profile that you may be strong here in one area and down here in another and down here in another. And I know that Nancy Young, when she made this, she really wanted to inform and the, the differentiation needed. So this was a high a high word that was strong with her is that just because yes, we all need that um, an understanding of how our language works, we're going to need it in different ways. Well, then if your group's already got that, you probably already got this. Although I will say that the groups I'm working with this on, we are changing this word to, we can have a conversation about it in one of my groups next time. It's like, well, who does tier three? So this, what about with you two? What would you call that tier three piece or person who's doing this? Is it also the reading specialist to the intervention personnel? In our else? building, it's really our special services. Um, so tier two is reading specialist intervention personnel. But our tier three is our specials, uh, our special services department. So our special education so teachers, our sped paraeducators. And I would suggest it would be everyone in tier two with the addition of special education staff. I, I like that. That The question is, so when Krista, when you say it's special education staff, 
do, are you then requiring students who need these additional supports to be evaluated for special education or are they still getting that as a pre-referral service? Uh, to be evaluated. Support. But, you know, I, and I have to say it hasn't always been that way. We've had um, more of an ideal model in the past when we had the personnel, you know, I'll give an example. Five years ago, maybe it's seven now, I, I've lost track of time, but I'll collaborate with a special education teacher. We had purchased some materials together. The groups were blended. It, you know, she would refer to me, hand select students that could fit into the traditional tier two reading groups. And, and that was lovely and, and worked. Um, as our population grew with students needing to be served, less opportunities for that have happened. So um, will we get back to that model? Hopefully, but uh, currently, no. Interesting. And I just look at the mm -hmm. students that we have now, mm -hmm. and I think most of the students in my system are getting tier two from their classroom teachers. I mean, if we think about how far outside the grade level band a teacher is covering content, what level mm -hmm. of intensity the interventions are. Um, yeah, and then tier, what we would typically think of as tier two is being layered on top of that just because we have kids with, with such deficits. I mean, classroom teachers can't teach last year's content. They have students that know the material from last year. They're having to differentiate at levels previously unknown. They're having to be more intentional about what they're teaching. They're having to really leverage smaller group size for those kids that have the greatest deficits to bring the intensity of those small groups, those interventions up. So This has been an interesting conversation. I appreciate that. Like I said, I'm taking it to a, a particular district next week. Um, this is one of the things that we're going to talk about too with the, the what, which it sounds like Krista, your, your curriculum provides this really well. Mm -hmm. um, the how is I think one of the pieces that you don't always get in a, in a curricula. And that's, I think one of the areas where that's, it's understanding the why, I think, that helps you understand the how. And I guess the question to both of you is, do you feel like your teachers know these well enough, what it means to be explicit and systematic, cumulative? I mean, with Cynthia, you mentioned how you don't get necessarily enough practice in some mm -hmm. of your, your curricula. So I think that the next work for the DAC team is to make Washington be one of those states where to teach pre-K through second grade, you have to pass a test that shows mm -hmm. that you know the science of reading and the instructional strategies that support those instructional areas. Yes, I'm right I mean, I, our pre-teachers are not coming out of university prepared to teach reading in the way that we know all kids need, but in the ways that in particular benefit kids at risk of reading difficulty. And since I'm not the queen of universities and can't make them change their pre-service courses, it might be something that we look at. As a district, we're looking at how do we incentivize people to stay in those grade levels? How do we layer in training mm -hmm. and support for them to really make them structured literacy, science of reading experts mm -hmm. um, so that our tier one is as rock solid as is possible? Mm -hmm. But that's hard when you're one in the sea of many, you know, mm -hmm. how teachers talk across district. We are a, dis yep. a state of local control, so it makes it really challenging. Um, I would love to see us look at some kind of competency-based model where teachers demonstrated that they could do this and that they should get paid more if they're going to teach K-1. And then they have to prove that they're good at it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love what, some, you know, I, what I'm hearing of the competency-based model, maybe even have a science of reading certificate or like mini credential that they do. We were actually, when I left Lake Washington, which was where I was for years and years in their intervention programs, we were working on grant, getting grants and, and working on um, 
that, that our reading specialists would all be, be certified with science of reading. Um, and even we were beginning talks with some universities about trying to get um, some of the practicum pieces in place, right? For that. And it just, I don't know what, I don't know what happened when I left a few years back, but. Mm, definitely something to look into. Go ahead, Krista. Well, in, I love what you said. I think those are great ideas. It, it's interesting because I've taught in different places and two different countries to think about how our, in, in, in many school districts, our neediest students are being served by our paraprofessionals, where I have uh -huh. also taught in a district on the East Coast where you had to have your master's in literacy to be a Title I reading teacher or get it within five years. And, and we were you know, a hotbed of learning through collaboration through a local university and every professional development I, uh, opportunity you can imagine, I had the opportunity to receive there, including university credit classes after school, right on our building, et cetera, et cetera. So coming from a really resource rich uh, uh, background, at the same time, high poverty, 70%-ish free and reduced lunch to the West Coast, from my, my experience here, we are having our folks work with the trickiest to teach kids and who've had the, uh, the lo uh, least amount of opportunities to um, have the training. So, I mean, one of the things that I carved out and I keep it sacred in my role is my paraprofessionals have one hour a week training with me every week. And I can say with confidence that there's no other paras receiving that much training in any program anywhere in our district. But it's so important because they're teaching K2 reading foundational mm -hmm. skills. Mm -hmm. So oh, you're really lucky that you have that. I'm curious to Krista, was that back East State, New York? Uh, Maine. Okay. Maine. Because I was in New York and I was just, uh, I've been shocked by the difference. Mm -hmm. I feel like when I, I was in California, I was teaching here, it was my normal. Mm -hmm. And then I went to New York, I was like, whoa, mm -hmm. I thought that California was so low. And then I came here and I've realized both for, with Oregon and here, there's just not the same kind of money being put towards exactly. education, particularly special education. When we talk about caseload size, I mean, I can go on and on. Mm -hmm. And I think that, I mean, a large part of that is both Oregon and Washington only have two out of the three legs of funding stools. Yes. Uh, we're both missing one of the tax bases that the other yes. states have. And that's like my experience in Maine, high, high property taxes paid for, you know, uh, a lot of resources, you know, class size. I look back and I could see pictures of my class, 12 kids, 14 kids, 15 kids, second grade. And so, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, I could do all that incredible teaching and you would not have mm -hmm. children struggling um, because of a variety of reasons. But um, it, I think the, our Washington teachers do amazing work with the resources we have. We're, we're, you know, they're rock stars. Um, I but, totally agree. Hashtag Washington educators rock. <laughs> because there's so much that we are able to do. No, I totally appreciate that. Um, this is another one that I've been sharing. And that's, again, Nancy Young, who did the Ladder of Reading, has a, a doc that she's created on um, what is structured literacy. And no, she's got one, two, three, four, five. The, the circle that you saw a moment ago had six. And it actually, IDA has changed their circle. They used to have um, phonemic awareness and Phonology was one, they just called it phonology, but then orthography was broken down into two. It was sound symbol correspondence and then syllabification. Um, I personally don't see the need to separate out these two. I would put them back together. Um, and orthography, I would continue to break because I would do more of a, a basic and an advanced because whether you want to call out slabification or not, there is a, a, a simple, easy, sound symbol correspondence, and then there's the complex. So anyway, um, 
she breaks it down into simply phonology, orthography, morphology, syntax, and semantics. But it gives a little bit of a of a what we're talking about. And I mean, I can't tell you how often teachers are not understanding that difference between phonemic awareness or phonological awareness and phonics. And I mean, Chris, it sounds like you have a, a program that's supporting them. And Cynthia, since you're doing Hagerty, they're focusing on the phonology piece to support that as well. It's just another source for, for us to be learning more on that. Because this is one of the things that I think it's really for us to be thinking about is, okay, we have our tiered literacy model. What are the structures we're using? It sounds like you, you have, you're working, you, you have a lot of that MTSS, the, the people, the time, the resources. And then the other piece, of course, is how we're measuring fidelity and our, our capacity to do this work, how we're, we're doing our, our progress monitoring, how we're keeping up, whether or not we're doing them. But then there's the content side is, what are we doing for, as you had talked a lot about, that, that tier one, that high quality instruction and their interventions in those, how are we making sure that those are, are secure? Um, and I'll tell you in, in other districts, there's a lot more work that needs to be done in this. And we, we bring in um, the simple view of reading. We talk about Scarborough's reading rope. We've brought in the Reading League's curriculum evaluation tool. Um, if you aren't familiar with it, I'm going to share it. And that's actually one of the things that we dove into in some of our other regions because they're at very different places when it comes to wow. Their, their bases on the science of reading and what their, what their curricula are able to help them with. Um, I'll go ahead and put that in there, that curriculum evaluation tool, but it sounds like it's not really as much of a need for you both on that. It's a useful tool. I'll go ahead and bring it up. Cricket. That Maybe you could use it to support if you have people are wondering and questioning you do too, um, because what it does is it looks at each of those areas, the phonological or phoneme awareness, the phonics, the fluency, language comprehension, that background knowledge, vocabulary, language, language structures, you can see uh, verbal reasoning, literacy knowledge, reading comprehension, writing and assessment and overall instructional design. And you can see each one has green flag and red flag. And, and this, is, this is something that one of, one of the other regions, we spent quite a bit of time, for example, looking at the phonics section and looking at your own system. And does it really, do you see any red flags? Are there any things? And if you do see a red flag, what can we use to support? Like Cynthia, that's actually one of the things that one of the groups had talked about is um, they could use Hagerty to support if their system didn't have that phonemic awareness after K1, or if their phonemic awareness didn't include some of those larger units like your Hagerty does. So you're already doing this. Again, like I said, you're doing rock stars. Um, That's not quite true. There's lots <laughs> of room for growth, but, but we're headed in the right direction. Well, and it's, there are tools to help us if we're not, and that's exactly one of the reasons why we, we're trying to do these, these PLCs is so that we can be sharing what's working, what's not, and what tools can we use to help be better. And so that's what I hope to try and provide is tools to help you along your way with wherever you feel like you be. Go ahead, Kristen. I'm just thinking, okay. yeah. <laughs> I think I did include these last time. So Cynthia, when I share the link to the, the slide deck with you, you'll um, have some resources that you that were in our last session, but I don't think you were able to join us last time. So that's why I put the word reminder is that some of these for how we're training those staffs, how we're working with them. And, and Krista, when it comes to the work that you're doing with your parents, I love hearing you say you're working with them weekly. Feel free to use any of these materials or contact me and I'd be happy to share with you any of the others as well. No, that'd be great, um, thank you. This goes to both of you, you too, Cynthia. And anybody else who's record listening to this as a recording, contact me and I'm happy to share any of my materials with you. Um, if you don't have access, do both of you know about my tinyurl.com resources thing? Oh, really? I see you nodding. 
So this was created, remember, um, if I'll go back to the that structured literacy circle, and they had those six elements in the middle, and we talked about phonology, orthography, morphology, syntax, semantics. So I initially created a 42-hour series that addresses each one of these. And then when we had COVID shutdown, I did a two-hour two -hour version and started creating this Google Doc of resources that went along with the courses. So for example, phonology and phonemic awareness, you'll find the David Kilpatrick's past, you'll find some other informal assessments, um, you'll find David Kilpatrick's table, literacy, how is rocket ship, et cetera. Um, letter and sound block tiles from really great reading, whatever I could find that were free resources out there in the interweb, I would add on and support. So you can see Silent E, many orthographic mapping, videos of how to use the sound letter maps, et cetera. And then of course it kept growing and kept growing. Um, but I've also added on this Padlet for identifying and teaching students at risk for dyslexia. And Shanna Brooks has given me her Padlet on the science of reading. So again, resources, resources, feel free to use them for anything that you have fun exploring. Feel free to add to them. Um, but these are all clickable links that will take you down to bookmarks down below. As well, I don't see anything else to be able to add on here. Kid-friendly books on dyslexia, dyslexia awareness materials. Um, in the Padlet, you'll find more on uh, dyslexia particularly, but also instruction, literacy, linguistics, etc. And if you have a great resource to share and you can't add it, I think some people, you should be able to add with that plus. If it doesn't let you, please send it to me and I've, I'll add it on. Um, but somebody sent me this fun video of Lucy Ricardo struggling with the O-U-G-H. <laughs> so to go back, oops, I must have accidentally clicked that. My apologies on that. So I'll just go share it this way. Some of the other pieces that um, we have for you that just talk you about the National Reading Panel 5, and this is one that Era and I put together of really layering this onto that foundation of oral language skills. And I think that Era and I share this with the council. Does this look familiar, Cynthia? Just a, maybe? I don't think I've seen this one. Um, we serve many things in many ways. So <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it bigger so you can see it. Um, it's just again, connecting the science of the simple view of reading to try and get this out of the way, hold up, there we go. I made it bigger so we can all see it again. There we go. And it's funny because when we did this, we initially, I think, had just these connecting language comprehension with decoding and reading comprehension. And I kept saying, we need more arrows. We need more arrows. <laughs> because as you both know, once you start this process, it starts, they influence each other in very complex ways. Um, and so we, we really wanted to make sure that we stress that basic of, basis of oral language of its at the beginning that's then developing and contributing to my knowledge of phonemic awareness, which contributes to my knowledge of phonics, which contributes to our flow, let's say, which contributes to our comprehension. And of course, they're also supported by our language comprehension along the way and as are our decoding and individually. As you can talk about, see that complexity there. And then of course, the ubiquitous reading rope, which we talk about very often as well. So at this point, we often invent, invited districts to again talk about what something that's new, something that's that's something you already knew, something that is new, and something that's renewed. When we're talking about defining high quality interventions and instruction into your literacy, and making known our why or how what we're doing is we're making known and new ideas visible to ourselves and our colleagues to shape and evaluate our interventions and instruction. And like I said, at some other districts where we've had much larger um, and much, much bigger shift, I think in some of our regions, some of our ESDs, there's more of an embrace of the science of reading and less of a shift than it is for others. Um. <laughs> no problem, Cynthia. 
I love it. I'm keeping myself muted because they keep yelling and they keep walking in front of the screen. So I turn my camera off. Sorry. (laughs) That's fun for us. That's okay. Um, So I'll, I can put this back into the chat box if you want, or I can kind of take notes or what are some of the things, um, I mean, there are some new resources. I feel like the most of the things are are things you already knew, but um, was there anything new that we brought broached this evening? or something that you feel has been renewed through this process? I think some work ahead of my district is aligning the intervention tools that are being used by our um, Title Lab um, intervention teams. There's There are a lot of really quality tools, but every school's kind of using the same tools, but at different times and in different ways. So I'm wondering, um, I'm thinking, you shared that kind of curriculum analysis tool with us that lets us compare it with how we know. I'm wondering if that might be a tool we can use as we try to bring our um, staff together and try to come to consensus on what we're going to use and when we're going to use it and which are the best tools to use and maybe which are outdated. Um, So I think that would be something that would be really useful for us in our work for aligning our interventions across our schools. I needed some juice on my sore or dry voice, so I put, muted myself. I definitely appreciate that. Thank you. Krista, how about you? Well, um, besides just the reminder about the tiny URL, I think I actually did the several hour course, but didn't realize about all the resources. But um, just back um, when you had mentioned that, um, Affirming what we know and that we're not changing what we're doing um, and just communicating that with our staff will be really important. Um, Just that we've added this new piece to our Mm -hmm. assessment profile. Um, Since our system is is strong already. Um, Trying to think what else. Again, you two are very lucky that that for you, it's not about changing. I think that you're you're kind of, we're lucky in that way. Mm -hmm. I was going to say anomalies, but I'm not sure. But I think that that this is definitely not the case across the state. That, um, and this this kind of contributes to when Sandra was saying all the time before that she wanted to find places where this is happening well Mm -hmm. to kind of connect with and, and help people see who are not as far along that, that this can happen and we can do this well. Mm-hmm. So I'm gonna make a note that you can. Yeah. And I feel like we have all the requisite component pieces mm-hmm. to be doing this well and to be getting great outcomes from our kids. But I feel like they're all kind of not quite in step with each other. And so when we look at our student outcomes, even though pieces have been layered in over years, even before COVID, we weren't really seeing that great change, positive change in student outcomes that we'd be hoping for. You know, Bremerton is a really high poverty district. Um, We serve all of the families, many of the families that work at the shipyard. It's a, there, there's a lot of students that come to school. Well, I'll say we have students that come to school like this. So we have, we have students that come to school with what we think of historically as school ready. And we have a whole bunch of students that don't come to school with what we think of as historically in education, what we think of as school ready skills. And so for us, it's trying to figure out how to get all those pieces working and what are the pieces we're missing? You know, some of the social emotional stuff, Mm -hmm. some of the um, neural ed pieces, right? What are we missing that we don't have in place as we try to just get everything running smoothly? We're not there yet. We have a lot of good pieces, but we're not there yet. I guess is what I'll say. Well, and and earlier when you talked about um, the difficulty with the automaticity piece, it makes me think of a uh, a webinar I attended recently put on by Oregon RTI. And um, I do have my slides if you're interested in seeing them from, it was Wiley Blevins. And I think that they still have, it was really good. It was really good. And one of the things he talked about so much was that we've been doing phonics for a while. 
And we haven't seen this needle move. Why? It's because the lack of connection between the phonics that we've been doing and the books the kids are doing for practice, that they're completely missing each other. And that's again where I pushed on that, that decodables is that they have to have the opportunity to practice what they're learning. And so when he said we, I mean, he's also talking about so, so many of our districts and our, our regions where if they are more of a whole language, more balanced literacy and more of a, a workshop model where the kids are picking authentic texts when they're not ready to be. And so I, I will say, I'm one of the first people to say there is a place for authentic texts, but they also need a more of a decodable if they're to develop that automaticity if they're not yet there. And so that's a piece I think that I can really support on that. I can't tell you how many times I've said, yes, children need to be lifelong readers. They need to read beautiful quality text, but nobody is going to read for enjoyment when it's hard for them. Exactly, if they can't. You need to make it not hard for them. And that's exactly one of the things that Era and I really worked on when we were putting the uh, ELA, not the menu of best practices. Oh, if I go OSPI, ELA, uh, here, no, there we go, the ESA, ELA standards page. And I will um, put the link in it if you guys haven't seen it. Have you scrolled down to the under, down here to the understanding the science of reading on the EOSPI ELA page? So you notice that it's at least two little pluses. That means you have to expand. And you'll see some additional resources. What is structured literacy? What is the science of reading? Um, an article by, I think this is, uh, this might be the Reading Rockets one, on the difference between structured and balanced literacy. And Aaron and I spent quite a bit of time crafting this sentence that explicit skill development, along with that exposure to great literature and read alouds, will ensure that students will be able to accept, access any type of reading independently. Students are not our goal is that independent skills. So I'll put this into the chat box for you if you want to not have to go searching for that. All right, awesome, you two have been fantastic. Um, the last thing I had planned was our team time um, for to give teams opportunity to talk and process and reflect, but you don't have teams with you. So um, we can also, I'm sure you wouldn't mind finishing up early. So um, I will say that there are, are places on the Jamboard for you to talk about um, your own capacity, uh, whether or not you need to prioritize assessments, where does assessment fit in? Um, are your teachers regularly using data protocols? What resources do you have? What resources do you need? Um, and if you need supports in any of these areas, like I said, please let me know and we can find ways to support you, um, whether myself or Patricia or I think Nina is your new RLC. I'm not, I haven't met her yet, but we'll work on that. Um, but I also then we have a survey that I'm going to give you to ask you for input on what would you like to hear more of next time? Where would you like our focus to be? So I'm going to put that in the chat box, um, as well as I know you two are aware of, that this is a good reminder for everyone about um, our bringing back, bringing in Marianne Wolf, Hugh Katz, Nadine Gab, Mark Seidenberg, Julie Washington, and David Kilpatrick um, to Washington. Please, please, please help get this message out. Um, if you want to take a screenshot of this, or if you don't have the PDF of that, let me know and I can put it into the chat box. Do you two have this flyer? I have it. I'm only going to be able to go to the first day. I'm so sad. Could you put the PDF in the chat box? I will. Please. So Cynthia, um, uh, we're still building out who's going to be on what day. Who, mm. who, do you really, who do you really want to see? I can work on trying to get them. <laughs> Uh, is that terrible if I say wolf? Not Patrick. all. I think, she, I think she's a high ticket item. Um, and, and I love listening. I know that not everybody loves listening to David Kilpatrick, but I like listening to him. Oh, he was amazing in person. Um, I think, yes, I, he's so smart. He truly is. Well, and Julie Washington, is, when you mentioned multilingual learners, that's her area of research too. Yeah, so put those three on day one. That'd be great. I'll see what I can do. <laughs> Hugh Katz is excellent too. 
Um, and so is Nadine Gabbett. She talks well, they very, all very quickly. They all are. But if I had to prioritize. Um, and hold on, getting that flyer for you. Uh, here it is, Beyond Dys Dyslexia Awareness Flyer. I hope this is the most recent one, 1123. Um, Center B for Beyond. And while you're digging out documents to mm -hmm. share, if you don't mind, the RTI Oregon. Of course, slides from. So mm -hmm. I think that's, I hope that's the, the right RTI with the flyer for this one. Let me grab that for you too. And I will go ahead then and stop the recording before I go digging. Um, let me find that. And just to put a, oh, I should have said thank you instead of thanks. I'm much more of a thank you type person. Yes. It's funny, I, when, okay, I stop recording. 